Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Trish Triumpho Sullivan and I'm going to give a quick lecture today on architecture, both an art and a science. Thank you for joining me today. So ever since we humans have come out of the <laughs> out of caves, basically, architecture has played a very vital role in our lives. It is both a necessity for shelter and an expressive statement. Architecture has often been overlooked as an art form and misunderstood as well. Um, yet it is an art form which surrounds us every day. We often take it for granted, even though we all need it to survive. So why shouldn't it be beautiful and bring joy to our lives? Our book defines architecture as the art and science of designing and constructing buildings for practical, aesthetic, and symbolic purposes. Architecture has its roots in the basic human need for shelter. Yet over 5,000 years, uh, for over 5,000 years, Cultures all over the world have constructed amazing buildings that are far from just shelter. I think this goes back to the basic human trait of creativity. We kind of have to have it. People have to create. Um, people have historically built their own homes, um, skills that were passed on from one generation to the next. An example of early creativity in humans is the dolmen in France. Let me see if I can find this on here. Here we go. And we'll take a quick look at this dolmen in France. Let's see if we can get this to go a little darker here. There we go. I think that might help. Okay. So, the dolmen in France, um, it's a tomb made from large boulders. Pretty simple. How many of you guys built tree houses or forts when you were young? I know I did. I remember using tables and blankets when I was really little and then graduating to cardboard and masking tape or duct tape um, and finally wooden nails um, to construct my secret spaces. As time went on, I relied on professionals to construct my living spaces, as did people in our earliest recorded history. Certain folks began to specialize in building homes and other structures. They discovered what worked and what didn't. Our ancestors were just as smart and innovative as we are. However, in those early times, tools and technology were yet to be invented. Some tools and technology were yet to be invented. Hence, early structures tended to be made of materials easy to find, right? And to use. So stone, mud, and wood, basically. It's important to remember that architecture is unique among the arts in that you must take time to experience it. Um, you can experience it only through exploration. One has to get inside the building, um, walk through it, walk around it, see the space and experience it, sometimes at different times of the day or even different times of the year in order to fully appreciate the structure. That's not true for a painting, a sculpture, or a photograph. We can see and experience the entire artwork in one sitting. We don't have to take a lot of time exploring it. Although some people do. <laughs> Excuse me. One very famous architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, was all about the experience and actually made his students build their own living quarters. Um, he was also very interested in buildings be, uh, that uh, being in harmony with with the nature and with the space around it. He was a groundbreaking architect. Um, for all structures, architects utilize 
three main concepts. And I'm gonna hold them up here. So as I'm talking, let's so get them. Um, so function, basically how it's used. Okay, uh, form, how it looks. And structure, how it stands up. All right, that's kind of some a few important things to know. As an art, architecture creates interior spaces and exterior shape. As a science, architecture must address the problems of holding its own weight and extra loads. It has to be able to withstand compression, okay, um, tension, and bending. Right? Especially in our area, we have a lot of earthquakes. Right, we have to make sure that that uh, these things can stand up. So basically, architecture has to look good and work properly. Currently, architecture consists of three main components: the frame. Let's see if I can get this up here so you can see it. Okay, so we've got the frame, the outer skin. So the frame would be like like our skeleton in our body right um so we've got our frame the frame um the outer skin which would be the exterior right and the operating equipment such as plumbing electrical uh those kind of things kind of like the organs in our body right um what what the organs in our body do for us of course back in the day structures didn't have any operating equipment right um, and the frame and skin were often one and the same. So let's talk about the evolution of architecture. Um, the techniques and styles, uh, along with the materials and the changing cultural and societal needs. So we'll kind of go through this. Um, let's see, we'll go back to this one here and we'll see if we can get this back in. It looks a little better. Hopefully you can see that okay. Um, our human housing began to evolve as soon as our hunter-gatherer ancestors came out of caves and began to farm and create villages. We went from huts and tents to more permanent and substantial structures. For most of our history, the tallest buildings were places of worship or had some religious significance. Now, in our capitalist culture, the tallest buildings are offices owned by big corporations. Most early building designers and in non-industrial, um, industrialized countries today use the materials, <clears throat> excuse me, they had on hand, right? Uh, regional styles developed that mirrored the local climate and location. So we would talk, say, if some place didn't have a lot of wood, but they had a lot of stone, we would notice all the structures were made of stone. The same as the opposite. Some place had a lot of wood, but not a lot of stone. Um, if we look at the American Southwest, they didn't have a lot of wood or a lot of stone, but they had a lot of mud, and so they made bricks, hence a lot of adobe uh, construction in our earlier uh, uh the earlier centuries before the America, the Spaniards and the and the Europeans came. So, um, with our modern world and technologies, we can build pretty much anything anywhere. Uh, and the result is a loss of a sense of place. Every place tends to look alike now. If you go to a downtown in any big city, there's a lot of big tall buildings, and they look pretty pretty much the same. Pretty cookie cutter. Um, in fact, that's what's happening in, in our downtown, downtown Salinas right now. Um, the city has taken a unique design done by a local architect by the name of Will Shaw, and I highly recommend you look him up. He's a very uh, talented guy. Um, and he, they've taken a design by, by Will Shaw and traded it in for a cookie-cutter look-alike um, design that the consultants have replicated all over the U.S. and all over the world. So, wood, stone, and brick, and, and brick, I mean by baked or fired mud, 
um, have been the choice throughout much of our history. Let's see. We'll put, uh, here we go, early. So stone, wood, and mud or brick. Um, and wood, because it's lightweight and usually readily available. Stone, because it's sturdy and usually readily available. And brick, also sturdy and easy to make by hand. Um, so let's look at these materials really quickly. We'll start with stone. Um, much like ancient architecture, or much ancient architecture, I should say, that we can still experience today was made of stone, right? It's long lasting um, because of its permanence. While stone is great for walls, it is not the best for roofs. Um, and wood has often been used for roof beams. One of the reasons that a lot of ancient buildings no longer have roofs, right? Wood won't last for 2000 years. It, it gets rotten and, and you know decays. Um, or if there's a fire, it'll burn in the fire where the stone won't. One of the easiest methods of building with stone is called dry masonry. Let's see if I have that written down somewhere. I thought I did. Aha, here we go. So there's stone, right? It's heavy, strong long lasting and there's dry masonry. So dry masonry basically means that there is no mortar or glue used to hold the stones together. All right there, there it's just called dry masonry and it's just like it sounds. The technique is to pile stones on top of one another. That's it. It's really simple to do. We often will see walls in the countryside built of people just piling one stone on top of another. Right. In dry masonry, um, the weight of the stones hold it together. When stones are cut or shaped, it's called dressed. So what that means is that they've actually chipped off, you know, some sides of it. Maybe they've squared it up so it'll sit better. Um, sometimes they make them exact same shape. Sometimes they cut them just enough to fit in that particular space that they're interested in um, doing. Uh, so uh, ancient um, examples are, say, Machu Picchu in Peru, um, and some of the ancient pueblos like Mesa Verde in uh, the American Southwest. <clears throat> so the largest ancient stone structure in Africa, south of the pyramids, because pyramids are pretty darn big, right, um, is called the Great Zimbabwe, and we have it right here behind me. I'll see if we can get this in a little bit better. There we go. Um, the Great Zimbabwe literally means big stone house. So it's, uh, the country was actually named after the structure, which I think is pretty fascinating. Um, it is thought to have been built in about the 12th century and uh, was part of a large trading city and it was uh, abandoned in the 1500s. And we, we're not sure why, but there's of course plenty of reasons. The walls were 30 feet high and 15 feet thick at the base. Let's just take a look here. Here's the, so you can see the, the design there of, of the, how large it is. Um, and so they were, they're, 30 feet high and 15 feet wide at the base and they slowly kind of tapered up from the base so it was you know wider at the bottom and narrower at the top um, of this <clears throat> um, and they are made of dressed stone so the people actually took time to dress the stone um, and then there there are a few doors in this structure there are no windows and that's because windows weaken the walls of large structures like this and imagine if you had a a window say on the ground floor and it was the bottom of the wall is 15 feet thick that means that's one long tunnel <laughs> of a window right so it doesn't make a lot of sense um so they were uh 
the roof on the Great Zimbabwe was probably made of um, of thatch or uh, wood or wood and thatch, something like that. So that's where that's what the uh, the thought is. Um, so this is a photo of the Great Zimbabwe right here. Let me take a look at that. Um, and uh, probably uh, it's, you'll see a picture in your book too. I think this is one of the one examples they have in the book. Um, next, that we'll talk about post and beam construction. And that was kind of the next big... Uh... Oh, here we go. Let me do this. We got, I think I... I don't know if I put this up here, but here we got, we have dry masonry, dressed stone, and then there's the, the great Zimbabwe. So in case you were wondering how that was spelled or what that's about. Right. Uh, so we've got post and beam construction. That was one, one of the, the earliest forms. Um, so post and beam construction let me see if we can see this here. There we go. We should be able to see that better. Um, so post and beam construction, um, basically up until the last century, um, the two main construction methods were post and beam and the arch. That's it. In fact, most of our architecture around the world has been built in post and beam construction. And it's pretty straightforward, right? You've got two uprights. Those are the posts and a beam that goes across on the top. Let's see if we can get this back so you can see that. There you go. Um, so there's the post and beam construction there as well. Um, using vertical posts top of the beam, the method is simple, right, and sturdy. It can be used with stone, wood, and metal. With stone posts, um, with stone posts that the or with stone, the posts must be substantial, like really, really big, to hold up the weight of the beam, um, and the beam fairly short, so you can't have a lot of room in between the posts. Um, wood, because of its weight, can work with longer beams, and metal, such as steel, makes it possible to have much longer beams and much larger structures. With stone, the form of the building is determined by both the strength and weakness of the stone. The posts are very strong, load-bearing uprights, but a stone beam is brittle and cannot, very, and cannot be very long. That's why we see um, monumental Egyptian structures with lots of posts, called columns, right, close together to support the stone beam. Let's see if we have... There you go. You can see a photo of it there. So here you see this. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's in Luxor. Oh, this is the colonnading court of Amenhotep. And that is about, um, about 1,400 years before current era. So we're talking, um, they used to say B.C., before Christ, and now they say before current era. Um, so this was around 3,500 years ago, so pretty long time ago. Um, so the example, in this example, it's the colonnade and court of Amenhotep III. Um, bundled reeds were used as the inspiration for the columns. Uh, and bundles of reeds were used in peasant housing. So they would bundle a bunch of reeds together and make a post, right? And that would be that would form um, the columns to hold up the beam, right? Um, so the Egyptians copied that in stone, which I think is very telling. About uh, we talked about regional styles. Well, what they used for their for their more humble abodes was also used for their monumental structures. And look, I mean, they're still standing three thousand five hundred years later. So, but pretty pretty sturdy stuff. Um, so, let's see, where was I at here? So, um, 
Yeah, oh, and the, I would know what I was going to say. The reason that they used bundled reeds is because they didn't have a lot of wood. There weren't a lot of forests in northern Africa where Egypt was. Um, they didn't, that wasn't the type of terrain it was. So stone was the most important thing they had to work with on a large scale. On small scale, they used, they used things that they had around, such as reeds from the Nile River, and they would bundle those together. Um, and so the, the culture copied that design um, in stone for what is called this colonnade. Um, and colonnade is the term for a row of columns spanned or connected by beams. So you can see them right back here in this, um, in this photo that I have on my screen. So after the Egyptians, the Greeks continued um, to utilize the post and beam method with tall columns and stone beams, a style that has influenced architecture around the world for over 2,000 years. Let's see if we have an example. Um, so post and beams structures were limited in size and design. Let me go back here, we'll look at, we'll look at this one more time. Um, they were limited in size and design due to the materials and physics involved. Um, the next great invention was the round arch. So there's our round arch. Um, here we go. We got post and beam and then round arch. Uh, and uh, the round arch was mostly used for tunnels and drains in the early civilizations of Asia and the Mediterranean, um, such as the Etruscans. Uh, they shared this technique with the Romans, who first perfected the use of the round arch for above-ground structures. Um, when extended, the round arch becomes a barrel vault. There we go. That's a barrel vault. You can see what that looks like. That was what the tunnels that were used by the, uh, uh, by the ancient peoples of, of the Mediterranean and, and Asia. Um, and, uh, and then the, so there's the, um, the barrel vault and the Romans also developed what's called the groin vault. And I think there's a photo of that here too. There we go. There's the groin vault, um, allowing for intersections of barrel vaults. So you could have like two long hallways, right? Connecting in an intersection, um, which is really cool. So there's the barrel vault and the round arch. Um, the Romans used a semicircle made of wedge-shaped stones, which you can see back here. You can see there's a semicircle of wedge-shaped stones um, with joints at right angles to the curve. Uh, during construction, wooden supports would be used to hold it up while, and then uh, until they placed the keystone. So the keystone is the final stone set in place um, and it creates a continuous arch with load-bearing capacity, which means you can put more stuff on top of it than just the arch itself. It has a capacity to carry a heavier load. Um, a series of arches supported by columns is called an arcade. Let's see if we see, there's an arcade. Um, and we're gonna pick up, uh, we're gonna pick this up on part two of our lecture. So for now, we're going to sign off and I'll be back again in just a few minutes with part two.